the days of true amateurism and the, uh, you couldn't get paid for the game, there was an allowance which was paid when you were playing overseas which was five bob a day when I started and it became a dollar a day later. But it kept you in sort of a toothpaste and razor blades and that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were real amateur days. Probably the most outstanding leader Australia's had, in my opinion. An outstanding figurehead. He led by example. He was a great advertisement for Australia off the field as well. A very erudite speaker. And was a great ambassador for the code in Australia. And Thorne had had a wonderful career as a rugby player, having started off actually in the back row, played in the second row, and then played in the front row for Australia. And, and been very successful and very successful captain of the South African tour. So he was actually, you know, revered by everyone. Sports writer Jim Webster has written about rugby for over half a century and remains impressed by Thornett's leadership qualities. A wonderful person, came from a, you know, a great sporting family as such and uh, I don't know if I've ever encountered a captain who demanded more respect than Thorne did. Even in retirement, um, the players still looked on Thorne as their leader, uh, you know, to this day. I was privileged to represent Australia during the 50s and 60s, when international rugby was far different from what it is today. Rug rugby tours of those days ranked, I believe, as the ultimate sporting experience. For Thornet, rugby tours were the ultimate sporting experience. And for those who toured with him, Thornett remains the ultimate sporting captain. His quiet and determined leadership, uh, his, his general behaviour and sincerity, he's basically a quiet man, but he, uh, he had an aura and it just permeated our attitude. Thornett had nothing but respect for Thornett. He'd been there, done it, they'd been a South African, been successful. Uh, he was you know, one of the world's finest gentlemen. John Thornett was an unbelievable character. Um, um, you, you did give your heart and soul for him. He was great. Great player and a great person. You wouldn't consider him to be a leader, but he was, just by example and his own demeanour. He, he never lost his cool and he treated everybody very well, with great respect and we respected him in return for that. The Wallabies playing in dark shirts, kicked off against Scotland at Murrayfield, fervently hoping that the last international in Britain would bring them victory. In Rugby Union's amateur heyday, Australian teams went to Europe only once a decade, and it was a grand tour like no other. Undoubtedly, the Wallabies were now playing the best football of their tour. J.E. Thornett scored their second try. The fourth Wallabies toured in 57-58, but lost all five of their test matches. Touring with the fourth Wallabies was a young John Thornett, who had debuted in 1955 and would lead the fifth Wallaby tour in 66-67. In breakaway, John Thornett cuts through and with Lenehan outside him, tries to breach the defence. But fullback Scotland is on the spot to save and the match is all over. British Isles 24, Australia 3. When John Thornett and his men were arriving on the international scene, success was but a dim memory for Australian rugby. Australia had played 36 test matches against major rugby nations between 1950 and 63, but had won only four. But all that was about to change. Captaincy of the Wallabies passed to John Thornett in 1962. Somewhere in that mess of players and mud and football. Australia had had to wait 29 years to defeat a major rugby nation on Australian soil. But in 1963, the drought finally broke. On a rain-sodden pitch in Sydney, Thornett's men beat England by 18 points to nine. Yes, it's a try. And look, Davis, the breakaway forward, who scored for Australia, 
Later in 1963, the touring Wallabies inflicted consecutive defeats on the mighty Springboks in South Africa, a feat not achieved by any side since 1896. The Wallabies are once again on the move and away. Their expert artistry makes it all seem so very, very easy. Thornett's Wallabies played some of their finest rugby on this three-month tour, and the bonds that developed between players on this African safari would hold Australian rugby in good stead for the years and even decades to come. Uh, the 63 side in Africa had one of the best team spirits you would ever, ever see. The whole 30 guys just got on so well. To have all that and to then to be able to look back and reflect on uh, some of the honours bestowed, it's uh, uh, just uh, marvellous memories and I would do it all over again for nothing. Thornett's tight-knit Wallabies were now in tune for some classic wins in 64 and 65. When the box toured in 1965, Australia secured its first ever series win over South Africa and the first series win over a major nation by Australia at home since 1934. Catch ball to Hawthorne. There's the full-time siren, the ball in touch and Australia has won the second test match. Australian captain John Thornett being chaired off the field after winning this series against South Africa, the first time in rugby union history that Australia has won a series against South Africa. Thornett once explained the success of Aussie rugby in his era by writing that we were blessed with the world's best players in key positions, naming Ken Catchpole at halfback, Rob Hemming in lineouts, Peter Johnson at hooker, and Greg Davis and Jules Gerasimov at breakaway. The fifth Wallabies departed Sydney on the 7th of October 1966, bound for the trip of a lifetime. Captaincy of the side again went to John Thornett with Catchpole as vice captain. The manager was Bill McLaughlin. Coaching responsibilities fell to Alan Roper, the assistant manager. I was of a similar age group to the guys in the in uh, the 66-67 team. So I got to know them fairly well and people nowadays wouldn't quite understand how far away Europe really was. It was almost incomprehensible to think that someone could take five months out of their lives, out of their, their education or their wage earning life to go away to play rugby. Their, their total livelihood disappeared for the best part of half a year. Huh. Australia won their second tour match against Midland Counties in Leicester, a game that skipper John Thornett would remember for all the wrong reasons. Yeah, that was a pretty big event for me. He packed against a guy called Piggy Powell, who was a pig farmer and contracted face pox which was uh, sores that broke out on his face. So not only was he not picked to play, but he couldn't train either because it was such a contagious uh, virus that if we were in close contact with the team, he had to put a plastic bag over his head. Well, John Thornett was a wonderful leader. And one of the great moments, or one of the saddest moments, was when he dropped himself on the way to Carter Farms Park. He thought, and I think only he thought that his form wasn't up to it, and he dropped himself. So not only was he a great leader, he was a great gentleman. Thorne was a good captain. You know, he was, uh, he possibly found it a bit hard to handle Mick and I. In one game we were playing, the referee stopped the game because we were getting a bit of stick. So Thorne pulled Mick and I out in front of the referee and said, if you two guys don't get sent off by the referee, I'll send you off. But, but that was Thorne, you know, he was, he was a purist. I don't think Thorne ever threw a punch in his life. The Cullen incident occurred in just the third match of the fifth Wallaby Tour. It all began when an Oxford University prop decided to target Australia's hooker Ross Cullen for a torrid time. What happened next, wrote rugby historian Jack Pollard, will be debated as long as international rugby endures. Our hooker was having trouble. You know, Ross Cullen was the hooker. And Ollie Waldron was the guy's name. He, he bought, instead of packing properly, this Ollie Waldron would dive in and pack against Ross Cullen. The, the pain from somebody boring in like that is excruciating. And he took the only action he could. 
And what happened, he bit him on the ear and Ollie panicked and jumped up into the, you know, out of the scrum and... Uh, it looked bad because it, when he stood up it was hanging down and bleeding. And the press obviously swarmed over it. It was headlines all around the, the world. Bill called a special meeting of the team and said, uh, I've decided I'm sending Ross Cullen home. Which, you know, was an you know, absolute disaster. The rugby history books have always recorded that skipper John Tornet stood by that decision. However, reflecting on these events in later years has brought John firmly to a different point of view. I think we were wrong. I don't know how. But Bill McLaughlin and I decided that and uh, Robert didn't agree. He just thought it was too severe. Well, I'm not reflection it was. But, uh, I suppose the, the first real buzz we got was uh, beating Wales when nobody expected us to uh, even challenge them. Their captain had been sidelined with a skin infection, their reserve hooker sent home. In 58 years, no Wallaby side had ever beaten Wales. The fifth Wallabies were given no chance. That's good, boys. Let's make it in for Australia. Purcells, some good work at the line out. Here's quick transfer down the line. And it's over to Lenham. He's got it, he's got it, he's got it. He's got it. He's got it. By the closing minutes, the Australians had won over the crowd, but with Wales still in striking distance, the match would go down to the wire. John Lloyd is there for Wales. And it's all over. The Wallabies have done it. They're absolutely thrilled. A famous win for Australia by 14 points to 11. Well, I would travel thousands of miles each weekend if I had an opportunity of seeing rugby football like we just seen, Peter. It would really was a magnificent game of rugby football and the Wallabies thoroughly deserved their win. When England kicked off at Twickenham, playing right to left, no one expected an easy win over the Wallabies. So much of the tourists improved in the last two months. On January 7, 1967, the fifth Wallabies came to Twickenham to take on England. The British press again applauded Thornett's gallantry for surrendering his place in the side and Catchpole captained Australia. My goodness, this is exciting stuff. And those fellows, when they come off the field, will know they've been in a match. Ashby, Glutter trying to cut inside Cardi. This is hot on the The Wallabies at the end forced England to concede more points than in any other test they had played at Twickenham. And in London that night the strains of Walsy Matilda could be heard around Piccadilly Circus as Australia supporters celebrated. But by tradition, visiting sides played the Barbarians as a big finish to their British Isles tour, picked from the best of Britain and Ireland. And Thornett's men were determined to put on an exciting exhibition. One of the terrific memories you had uh, in your time in, with the Wallaby Colours was the Barbarian game in Carter some years ago where you were yeah. reduced to tears again. Yes, that's true. It was a marvellous game. At the end of the tour, we'd had a mixed tour and that was the last game. And, uh, and I've ever said it was a marvellous, uh, the biggest ovation I've ever heard from a, great, a crowd. And, and was, they sang you all sing Matilda and that was yes, the end of the until the end of the game. It was a marvellous, a marvellous yeah. conclusion. To think of singing like that, and John Thornett, who was the captain of the Australian team, was carried shoulder high, leaving the ground, and the crowd singing, Walsing Matilda. At the Stade de Colombe in Paris, on the 11th of February, 1967, the fifth Wallabies ran out as favourites to defeat L'Equipe de France. John Thornett finally judged himself fit to run on for a test 
in what would prove to be his career finale. France defeated the Wallabies 20 points to 14. For Australian rugby, there would never be another Northern Hemisphere effort on the scale of the fifth Wallaby Tour. More than 700,000 spectators had come to watch them play in 36 matches. The side had entered the history books with first wins over Wales and the Barbarians and the tour marked the climax of the Thornet era. Perhaps more importantly was subsequently, the first ever coaching panel came, came together um, and pretty much grew out of the Thornet era. But Bill McLaughlin was head of Australian rugby and he appointed Dick Marks, um, head of our first coach education panel. Peter Criddle was chairman and it comprised Peter Johnson, John Thornett and uh, John Friedman. For me, nothing before or since has ever been more important to Australian rugby. So out of that era, out of that team and out of that subsequent era of administrators and coaches and coach educators, Australian rugby really developed into the number one team in the world. And, and we, owe it all to, we, we owe it all to that era. We mustn't forget that. John, I think you are an, a unique example of a rugby union player and a very great one too. There's nothing else to say except, I think, John Thornett, captain of Australia. This is your life.